Well, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He is worthy of praise. You love the Lord with all your heart. This is what God is after in our lives, is a people that are literally, if I can use this term, hopelessly devoted. But I know that we're not without hope. It's just hopeless to everything else, right? When you become totally devoted to him, that everything else has no hope, not a prayer, that you can be turned in that direction. Yeah, I, I know we as people have spent, you know, centuries and generations trying to perfect what God has already perfected. We try to make things happen that God has already made happen. And what God is doing in the earth is bringing heaven down. Yeah. He's bringing the fullness of who He is into a full manifestation where that which is invisible becomes visible, that which is intangible can actually be seen, heard, touched, smelled, tasted. All the things that God had determined from the very beginning. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Thank you, Jesus. I was thinking about that, you know, I, I, love, I love that God has given us all the pictures and we, we've talked about all these different things uh, through many messages that everybody preaches and books that are written and uh, all those kinds of things that God, He puts them in... Uh, visible places, elementary places, so to speak, that so you and I can really understand and relate to, relate to what God is, what God's purpose is. How's that? that that's really what I should say, what God's purpose is. You know, like it says in Romans one twenty one, he took invisible or he took visible things to make us understand invisible things that would show forth the excellency and the power of God. If we really understand the power of God, it really is speaking of his executive order, how he executes his purpose. I think about the two Pillars, we talked about pillars the other night, the seven pillars. Wisdom has built her seven pillars, right? And how James wrote about it, that the wisdom that comes from above is like this. It's no other way. It's established. And so I got thinking about the pillars and reading about it a little bit, the pillars that Solomon put at his temple, he put the two pillars, one on the left and one on the right. The left one being Boaz, he named, and the right one being uh, Jachim, or whatever how you say it, I'm not really sure. But the interesting thing about what their names mean is, I think Boaz, we talked about when we did the Book of Ruth, means strength, and, and, uh, and uh Jachim, is that how you say it? Jachim, I don't know. I'm going to have to look up the El Sabat way to do it. But Jachim, he, his name means to establish. So when we talk about power, we have to understand that the two pillars are he's able to do it. Establish, to do it. He has the ability. He has the power. This is why Balaam told Balak, look, whatever you want me to do, I can act like I'm going to do it, but my word cannot supersede the word of the Lord. If he says it, so shall it be. And so God has declared, he has determined, he has purposed. He has purposed. Everybody say he has purposed. 
He's determined. He's determined that He will dwell in fullness, completeness, maturity. I like this. When, when, uh, when, when, um, when Jesus, when they came to Jesus and they talked about, you know, and he talked about Herod and what Herod was going to do. And Jesus said to Herod, or he said to them, you go tell Herod. Remember this? He said, you go tell Herod. He, like, he does miracles and healings and everything in the first and the second day. But does anybody really remember what he said after that? He said, and in the third day, I will be perfected, completed, full. He wasn't just talking about when he got up out of that grave. That was absolutely an application. That was the only thing that they could see at that particular moment. Unfortunately, for some Christian folks, it's the only thing that they can still see today. But God, in His infinite mercy, has let us see that portion beyond the horizon. That He has a body that will be mature, complete, full. Not full of anything other than Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto Himself. Amen? Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but like... And, and we have to come to this, like, like it's getting really difficult to preach. It really is in, a, like in this context of study and read and, and, and hope that you, because what God is really trying to get you and I to understand is this, this old system that we live in is literally fading glory. I remember when Walmart first came to town and I noticed that their, their, uh, their clothing, which I never bought any from there, uh, there was literally labeled fading glory. That was back in the 80s, I think, you know, late 80s. Fading glory. It isn't that you still can't put on the clothing or you have to not walk in the way what God is doing. But what God's doing is this. He's removing the veil. Remember what happened when Moses came down out of the mountain? They said to us, look, don't let that talk to us anymore. We don't want to see your face. Put a veil over the face. And eventually the veil caused the glory to... Fade, But God is doing the exact opposite. He's renting the veil in our lives. The Bible says that he broke through or he stepped through the veil of the flesh so that all of the Father's life, the invisible life, could now become, like John said, we touched him. We handled him. It was no longer knowing him after the naturalness. We all of a sudden now see the Father in the Son. One that can't do anything other than what he has been designed to do. And the only way you can ever get that heart in fullness is to walk the path, the journey, the highway that God has called His people to travel. It's the only way. Man has had a lot of exits and a lot of stops along the road and, and we've even done it ourselves at time and it's only been the mercy of God that just winds the rubber bands up again so we can just keep right on going. We'll have arguments over whether the, the internal combustion engine's going away and going to be replaced by the electric engine, but God is in the, the, the position of transformation, transitioning to a fullness of what He's doing. And mankind will argue over that too. But God, God, He put it in our hearts. 
His purpose is there. Turn with me to Romans 8. I have no idea where I'm going to start today other than right here. I think we've already started if we're good with that. Romans 8. I'm just going to jump right in. Verse 28. I was reading this over and over and over all week long, and, and there's just so much here. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to share it in a studious manter, manner at all. I just, I just want the Holy Ghost to change our lives. I mean, really, I, I'm not just saying that. I, I'm literally saying that God is moving. Like, l- literally, He's moving in our lives in a way that we have never moved before. I love, I, I, I just love it. I've read it over and over and over this week. Again, it's just since Wednesday night that look, Re- Revelation 3.12. God will make us a pillar in his temple that you will go out no more. Yeah. Thou art, thou art a priest forever. And, and I, you know, I, I want, and I want to make this clear. And I, I know that we understand this and everything, but I think when we talk about Mary and we talk about Mary's salutation and we talk about the chief musician and we talk about the one that sings and, and, and preaches and does all these things through our lives, what really has happened in the church world is we, like the Colossians, stopped holding up the head. And all of a sudden now we have to actually qualify and we have to let people know and understand because we're so natural. We don't move by spirit, the spirit. Spirit of God, knowing that when someone is talking, they totally fully understand because they hear the voice of heaven and not the voice of the vessel. And God is after a people that hear his voice no matter what. You can preach messages like we preach and someone can listen to them on a video and they'll think, oh, it's all about them. And this is why God puts us in individual families, in individual congregations, so that God can work on us and grow together, that the sound that comes out is not about an individual other than the Christ in a body, a people who have overcome themselves. I literally, I literally text this to my brother Stephen this morning. I said, you beat the lion and you beat the bear. And he texts me back. He says, does that mean I have a Goliath coming? And I said, we all do, with a stone right between the eyes. Meaning that our biggest battle that any of us will have is not the lion, the devil, not the bear, the world, but the way we think about what God is doing. Remember, he gives us mercy for today, even though you can only see seven, not past the horizon. There are times he will take us into dimensions to let us know. But like Elisha, when he said to his servant, he said, he said, hey, servant. He's like, "Uh, here comes the woman that had the baby. Uh, It looks like there's trouble. And uh, God didn't tell us. And we'd preach a whole message or we'd, we'd go about telling people, well, you don't know everything and you don't see everything, never understanding that God hides things for the mercy of the day. It's all about knowing Him. Come on. It's all about knowing Him. We count everything as loss. We give it all away. 
that we might know him. Abraham, God promised him that his seed would be like the stars of heaven and the sand of the sea. And God multiplied just him and an old lady and made that in one. Like we, we think a million people is not a big deal. But to them, there might not even been a million on the globe. And before you knew it, his seed was that big. Because God had determined that his family would be that big. But in the midst of all that, we see that the Hebrew writer wrote this, but he still looked for a city, a people, that was bigger than his natural seed. Not in quantity of number, but in quality of nature and character that came from another dimension outside of himself. A seed. A seed that only could be planted within us. Not a little mustard seed, but a mustard seed. A life full grown which became the earnest, the down payment, the engagement, that if he transformed, changed our spirit, that he will change our souls and vile bodies. We can't spend all of our time talking about what's right and wrong any longer. We've come to the hour, have to understand, have to be mature, have to know that these vile things, bodies of death, have a promise that must be satisfied. As soon as Goliath has his head cut off, Hallelujah. He's called us to this. Here we go. Romans 8, 28. I'm all messed up today. I've been messed up for a while. I know you guys have known that. And I know, I just know. I love this, how it starts off. Like we just, we read through it, we quote it because we're so used to it and, it's, and we believe it. We believe it. We believe it. We really do believe it. But this is what God's trying to do in our lives. He's, he's establishing in our lives. This is what he's doing, that it becomes a living reality and not just. I, I said this several months back, and I say it to myself all the time. Every time I find my own self getting into the position that I need a message instead of rehearsing, let there be a releasing of who he is. You mean you have that issue? I, I really don't, but my mind sometimes does. My daddy used to always say, tell your mind to hush. And because I'm more crude, I guess, I tell my mind to drop dead. There's no need anymore. Have the mind of Christ. Let it grow. Let's hold the head up. I love this. I'm going to say it real quiet. So just the words themselves. And we know. We know. No, literally, we know. No, can you hear that? We know. And we know that all things work together for good. Now listen to this. To them. To them. Who are they them? To them that love. Love, agapeo, love, God. It's the first, what's the most, the chiefest, the highest, the best commandment, master. It's in the seed. 
It's in the seed that is able to perform it. He's able to do it. All I have to do is walk with him and talk with him and pay attention to him and follow him. And his life will perform what he is able to do. I literally had this thought this morning while I laid in the bed that the Father, this is what God is doing. I don't even know why, it just came to me. But look at, He's taking our hearts and He's melting them like wax in a pool that it can be transformed into the visible heart of the Father. It's one thing to do it But God's determined. And what will melt our hearts? Loving God with all that is within us. What's within you? The seed. The holy seed. Well, I know I learned. See, like I was telling Steve this yesterday when I stopped by and dropped something off. I think Rebecca was there too. Isaiah prophesied and he, he taught it like this. And I, I, I've quoted it for many years and you've heard my story. But all of a sudden God began to show me in the last couple of weeks something I, I saw a dimension of it. He like, says, you love me with your mouth. You honor me with your lips. But your hearts are far from me. And your fear of me is taught by the precepts of men. And when Isaiah declared that, it was a warning. He was admonishing them to change. But he was doing it from a perspective that the only thing they were doing was the opposite of what God desired. But all of a sudden, Jesus picked that same thing up and he was declaring the exact same thing to Israel of old. Right? Before he went to the cross and everything and changed life. But I was meditating and God gave me that verse again and, and all of a sudden I saw it in a whole new light. Do you love me? You honor me with your lips. But your heart is far from me. Not because you've done anything wrong. It's because I'm up farther than you could ever imagine. And the only thing you know has been taught to you. But what I have prepared for you is abundantly above. It's greater. It's more powerful. Not to do what the church will has been to do, but to do the will of the Father's heart. It's greater. For those that love Him, He works everything to good. Uh, you've heard it said many times, over and over and over, He'll let us believe whatever we believe. To get us to where he's taken us. The river, the king's heart, is like that. It twists and turns all through this life. And he'll work every bit of that out in order to perform his will. Saul was a very traditional religious king. He loved God. But he did not love God the same way David did. 
Come on. All Saul did was disobey God and he didn't kill everybody and he took all the stuff. David had an affair. David numbered the people. David did things that you and I would never, ever go to his church or let him be king in our lives ever. But he had a heart. I said this many times, right? Like the difference between Saul and David was all those psalms. And the reason he had all those songs was because the chief musician was allowed to sing at every up and down. I was reading a verse the other day and it said there's valleys next to the hills. There's always valleys next to the hills. There's twists and turns and the rivers run down the mountains and through the valleys and over everything because God is twisting and turning the hearts of those that He knows loves Him. And He's working out everything in life for the good of the purpose of God. We've sat back way too long with a, you know, we, we, we have pendulum swings in the church. You have people that are either really this way or really that way, and God's above it all. I can go in some churches this morning and you're going to hell just because you dress the wrong way. Or I can go in churches this morning because God is so good and loving and kind, He'll let you do whatever you want in hell. And God's, God's above it. He's outside of that way of thinking. He's come. To bring us life. A life that's greater than anything you and I Amen. could ever dream. We know, we know, I got to get going. We know that all things work together for them that love God. And to them, them, he's still talking like them, right? To them, them who are the called according to the purpose. Now, I don't have time to sit here and clear all the thoughts of this, that, and the other thing. It's just that I'm going to take His Word at face value and know that if I trust Him, He will perform establish. He's able to do abundantly above. Well, mankind, religious mankind will argue over who's in and who's out. Everybody say this with me. But God. God sets all kinds of patterns. He really does. He really does. He sets all kinds of patterns from His Word. And then He sets all those patterns in our life. And then you know what He does? He throws us a curveball. I was talking to someone. Who was I talking to? You didn't think the other day? Was it about the curveball? I was talking to someone about the curveball. There's a lot of good hitters in the AAA minor leagues. And the only reason they never can make it to the big leagues is because they don't know how to throw a curveball. Because if anybody that knows how to throw a good curveball is already in the majors. And sometimes God throws us curveballs. And you have to be able to hit the curveball. And so when God sets patterns, 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 and all we ever do is look for fastballs, patterns, patterns, that always look the same, then God will throw us a curveball, an anomaly. Something that doesn't look like the pattern any longer. Because what he's ultimately trying to get you and I to do is to follow the pattern of his voice in our lives. Any wonder that everybody has their own voice pattern and that we now have the technology to prove that? Because folks probably disputed it for all those years. So God 
in his infinite, infinite wisdom knew that a generation was coming that only needed the facts, scientific facts, that he gave every individual their own uniqueness so that he could rearrange it, that everybody could only see God's uniqueness through them. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate, here it is, to be conformed to the image of his son. This is why the son sings. This is why he gave us the spirit of his son. This is why the son cries out in our lives. We never understand that all the twists and turns in our lives is because He chose us. He determined. He predetermined this. He predestinated us. I know that some folks will take that in the direction, like way over here, and they'll say, we can't fail. And some folks over here will take and fight that off because it's like, well, wait a minute. God came to save everybody. Never understanding that what God was really doing was determining that humanity was the destination of his life. And if you, like Paul wrote here, come to a place in God that says, I know. Because if I get down to the bottom of this chapter that nothing can separate, it's not just something someone taught us. It's something that has been settled in the seed inside of our lives. You may go crazy in your mind and people will think you're mad, but you've come to an understanding knowing, I know. My whole life could fall apart and I could fall on the ground and die and everybody will think, oh my God, when, 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 when your mama died, people literally said, well, will he still believe in life? Yes, because life isn't just an existence. Life is a person living within a people. And all God wants to do is take all the hurt away so that the life of who he is will manifest the fullness. Brother Doc sat right in our front room. He literally quoted this scripture when someone said, I don't understand what happened the day of the funeral. And he said, God works all things together for good. Because this is who he is. This same God doesn't limit himself to an existence of this life that you and I could at best, at best, as some Christians would hope, 120 years. And no matter how good your life is, let me tell you something right now. From 50 to 100 isn't the same from 0 to 50. And I'm certain that from 100 to 120 is just existing. And because we live in Mary Poppins land in, in the church, we think God's just going to abracadabra us when he says, I'll twist you and turn you. I'll form you. I'll mold you. I'll do every single thing in my power, my abilities to establish, to produce the sun in not individually any longer. My God, that's been the classical sonship message. And this is why the folks that are just coming along understanding sonship now never will understand. It was not about me. It was all about him. Not me as an individual, but him as a body. And though we will talk it with a veneer application in our lives, God has come to spring forth, burst forth, Whew. in a way that mankind has never seen it. 
to be conformed to the image of his son. Why? That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. Jesus said this, many are called, but few are chosen. My dad preached it like few will choose. I see it both ways. Revelation, I read it the other day. Many are called. No, 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 no. The the called, the chosen, and the faithful. In other words, they arose to the calling. They overcame. What did they overcome? Everything. We read that verse. Revelation 21, verse 7. And whom He called, them He also justified. It lets me know, Corey, that no matter how much I try to be good and make everything right, and there's nothing wrong with that, that what God has determined, there's something higher. Well, does that mean I can just continue in missing the mark? God forbid. I don't have to live up to your standard. Yeah, you're right. Never have had to. But just remember, live up to His. How does that work? You hear His voice. And you don't quench the Spirit. It's too easy to settle into my own mindsets. Because when we do, we'll miss. You know, when the princes of Babylon came to visit Hezekiah. Do you know what God did? Could you imagine this? Well, God, he, he would have figured it out for him. So he would, No, he said, I left him at his own doing to try his heart. I think God knew what his heart was already like. I think God wanted him to fail. You think he wanted Judas to offer him up? You think Adam wanted him, he wanted Adam to fall? And I, I like to re, I'm going to rephrase the word fall. We have such a negative condensation of it, but that's really what he did. He descended. He condescended from where the Father had created him. And Jesus has already set us in heavenly places. Determined. How did he set us in heavenly places? That when he ascended on high and sat down, he said that where I am, you'll be there also. So now I'll put my spirit inside of you so that you as a people can be conformed to the image of the Son and then know how to live and move and have your being from the most holy place. When the Bible says we have an anchor for our soul, do you know where the anchor is? On the other side of the veil. It's in the most holy place. Yeah. And then he justified, he glorified. All right. Are you good? Is everybody good? Psalms 132, verse 13. Psalms 132, verse 13. For those that are called according to His what? Purpose. Purpose. Do you know why we have the extremes and everything in between of exclusivity and inclusion? 
It's to muddy the waters. It's the rivers of Babylon. It's to cause Christians to think multiple ways. God's made life so easy for us. 21st century Americans in the USA, United States of America, made it easy. I tell you this all the time. Like, seriously, I was just telling Nathaniel on the way over here. I said, you know what? I absolutely love Christmas time and online shopping. It makes it so much easier for me. Give me a list, I go buy it. They send it to my house, the money comes out of my bank accounts, and it just like, it's like magic. It's magic. But you know what I miss about it? Or what we, what we miss in all that is God frees up our minds for the real purpose of what he's doing in the earth. I don't have to hunt and fish unless I want to do it for relaxation. I don't have to work on cars. I don't have to like this. I don't have to do that. I don't have to like, like, like. Seriously, it's really nice when our lives become released from the earth. This is what I I heard it the other night when I read it and I've been thinking about it. These were people who were redeemed from the earth. And I listened to my message it's like he's weaning us. And then literally my brother Stephen he was talking about Samuel and how Hannah weaned him. Weaned him from the mother. (laughs) Weaned him from the church. (laughs) Weaned him from the earth realm because Now his life can be sustained in the heavens, in the sun. See, you know, one of our problems, one of my problems, you know what, I thank God he's healing me. He's really healing me. Like I never saw most of the stuff. I I see it in a whole new light, a whole new way. Because one of the things I always believed in, God's always, you know, I've been like this, son. You can relate to this, brother. You can have a really tender heart, or you can have a really tough heart, can't you? And sometimes you just can't help it. You get so, you just can't hide it both ways. It's pendulum swings. It's the immaturity of our lives. And God comes to heal, to deliver, to change, to mature to bring about, no matter how good or how bad or how nice or how rotten. See, you can be the nicest person in the whole world. I just can't believe that person went out and slaughtered his whole family. He was like the nicest person in the whole world. Natural man. Carnal man. This is a secret. God only works from the inside out. No matter how hard we try, we think our outside circumstances are changing us. No, he just twists us into those positions so that we... Solomon, right, built a temple that his daddy prepared all the material for. And God is preparing the material out in the quarry, in the valley of the shadow of death, so that he can bring forth a life that functions and operates from the mercy seat. Not human kindness that will pervert judgment which is the way the church has become because we have so much whatever goes and not so much going to throw you in jail and hell and everything else and never show you the love of God because you really 
ticked me off because you didn't follow my standard. But the image of the full-grown son, Jesus the Christ, that not me, you, or anyone else can perform. It's not by works. It's by grace. The enablement of him being able to do in a people who love him with their whole hearts. Because the purpose is this, verse 13, for the Lord has chosen Zion. I'm going to intermingle some versions. As his dwelling place, his home, Zion. You know what's cool? David Zion, David Zion was really Zion. This is where he put the tent. This is where he put the tabernacle after he brought it up, right? This was the place. But do you know where Solomon's Zion was? It was enlarged. Remember that? He moved it over onto where? Mount Moriah. What was on Mount Moriah? It was the place of sacrifice where Abraham took Isaac up into a mountain and heard because he was friends with God. He was friends with God. He, he, he understood. He was friends. He was intimate with God. He had a better relationship with God than anybody else because the only two people that went up into the mountain wasn't the husband and the wife. It was the father and the son so that his judgment wouldn't get clouded and hear another voice, but only the voice of the Father. Help us, Jesus. And then you know what showed up a long time after that was Ornan's threshing floor. Not Mount Zion over where David was. Mount Zion over where Solomon, Jesus, was. Everybody say this with me. Zion was enlarged that day. It became bigger than David could ever imagine. But I think David saw it or he wouldn't have prepared all that material because he totally understood that where no, no, see that, I, like I just blew my mind apart, that where David had initially thought Zion had to be, had to be bigger, a bigger place for everything that he prepared for. And it had to be on a place, are you ready for this? Of sacrifice, separating us from ourselves. The chaff, from the wheat. Look, the hard shell for the grain was good out in the field. It was necessary. Like everything I've been through in life has been necessary. But it's only getting the seed to where he's taking it. I'm never going to get done. I'm going to pick this up Wednesday. I'm going to stop. Now, I've really been working on my lying. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his habitation. This is my rest forever. Steve loves to send me Ruth 318. So we might as well read it. And I'm going to stop. I have a bunch more verses. But honestly, I'm going to stop. I really honestly am because I think God has said plenty for us this morning. This is my rest forever. Here I will dwell for I have, what did he do? He desired it. He destined it. He determined it. 
He predetermined. He said it long before you and I. Messed up today, bud. Because God has chosen us. We're nothing special. Like I've been thinking about this return to the first love. You left your first love. You left. Like, we, 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 like I see it from the mercy seat now. I see it from a whole other dimension. Like if you read the church of Ephesus, all the things that it said about them in Revelation chapter 1 or 2, was it 2? And Revelation 2, they were all good things. He said, but I just have one little thing. You left your first love. Like, we, we, we preached it, like, to get people back in, in I've done it. Like, like, you need to fall in love with Jesus and get your act together. And, and I know there's truths and all that, but look at what he's really saying is this. He says, there's a love. He wasn't talking just to the individual. The Adam descended from. It's a first love. It's a chief love. It's a better love. It's better than anything you have ever experienced to this moment. You've never ever like you turn the TV on at Christmas time and you see all those people with like at all those jewelry commercials and like people are so in love and you're like that's love that's all like it's better. No, no, it, it, it can stir feelings in you because it, it can it can it can stir feelings in you because it can it can get you to start thinking and relating like about your own circumstances your own but then all of a sudden then God he just like. He blows on it, and he's like, oh, my God, this is bigger than us. It's bigger than me. It's so big. It's abundantly above. I couldn't even think about this. I was living in my own world just doing my own thing. It's above. This is what he's desired. This is what he's determined. Look, look, he didn't even say repent, return to your first love. He said repent and do the first work. Well, what was the first work? It was the love of God. It wasn't an action in the sense of like, I got to run out and go do something. It was like this, the ability to release his life, his nature, and his character in everything he can say and do. Rule 318, and we're going to stop. And I'm going to come back and pick this up. On Wednesday night. Hallelujah. Everybody say hallelujah. He's stopping. Just kidding. (laughs) Now, when we hear the preacher, and if he makes us happy with his word, and then we get up and we are honest with ourselves and we see at times that the life can be daunting, Do you know why we have fiery trials, anyone? It says it's for the refining of your faith. It's to increase your strength. Seriously. Yeah. Because why? Because, look, he says, if you faint in the day of adversity, you're what? Strength. Your ability to do is small. So when it's daunting, this is what you have to do. You have to understand this. Say, like, listen to me, little secret. I will probably talk about this on Wednesday, but I'm just a little ahead of myself. Like I said, I was only going to read one more verse, and I'm going to stop, and I'm going to hold myself to it. But listen, the hardest thing that the whole church world had to do when Jesus said, I'm leaving right now in Acts chapter 1, and all I want you to do is go to Jerusalem, a place of peace, and wait for me. Don't start the feast without me, Saul. Just wait till I show up. And when I do, I'm going to change you in a way that you can't even imagine. The folks around you are going to think you've been drinking alcohol. And Peter is going to have to explain, not drunk, like what you're used to seeing in church but a whole new world and dimension that nobody has ever seen before 
Not even his own disciples fully understood that, my God, what are we doing right here? Because it took them some time after getting filled with the Holy Ghost to understand that we touched and we handled and we... (laughs) I'll say it after the camera goes off. (laughs) You ready? So when the task looks daunting... (laughs) and the troubles, and the waves, and all those things. Help me, Jesus. Do you know? There's the plains of Sharon, where life is just good, and the sheep are eating good, and you know God's just filling them up with all the grass they can eat. And then there's the valleys of Achor. The trials, and the tribulations, and the troubles. And it's happening at the exact same time in people's lives. So when life gets daunting, remember this. This is what Naomi said to Ruth. Then she said, sit still, my daughter. If the daughters of Zion in the Song of Solomon, of Jerusalem, I mean, would have realized this, the daughters of peace, just wait till he shows up. All your questions will be answered. Sit still, my daughter, until thou know. Oh, that I might know him. Oh, that I might know him. I like I told Daniel, give me the give me the song, the words of this song, and she goes, "You want me to sing it?" I said, "No, not really, but you know." And I did have this thought that after I preached this morning, that maybe we'd sing this song, but we won't sing it because I'm not going to be a liar today. But that I might know Him, that I count all things for loss. I don't want to be satisfied with just one portion of Jesus my spirit realm. I want to be satisfied in all three dimensions of my life, which incorporates a people blending together as one. Until thou know how the matter will come out, fall, right? For the man, everybody say the man child, the man child, Jesus the Christ inside of a people. The man will not be in rest he, until he have finished the thing this day. Let's stand. Do you get that? It's really cool. Like Isaiah prophesied this. He said, give him no rest until he makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. Wait, he just told us to rest. Do you know what our resting is? Prayer. That's what they were doing in the upper room. They were praying. They were seeking the Lord's face. They were standing between the porch and the altar, dying to themselves. So that God could work, establish, what he had desired to do in a people. Everything we have in life is imagery of a spiritual life that will be manifested in a natural creation, a created place. An uncreated life to be expressed. Now don't fall down forever it can't be undone Jesus there's nothing else I can say but yes Lord finish what you started because we believe we're confident in your abilities not our inabilities in you we live and move have our being so Father continue to bless us for the purpose of satisfying your heart. The namesake, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus.